Hi everybody. Currently working on my uh, lighting situation here. Uh, that's better. It is the 19th of January, 2023. I'm a little bit behind. I'm a lot behind. Sorry. Um, it's been kind of a funny day. My wife and my two older kids are down in um, Sacramento for like a homeschool uh, thing, like a field trip. I don't know how to explain it, but they are um, like next door to the Capitol building and they're meeting a bunch of um, state legislators and things like that. Uh, they called me about 20 minutes ago. They had just finished. And uh, my, as my wife was getting on the freeway, she said, Hey, that person's in their underwear. Which the first thing I think of was, well, that's Sacramento. It's turned into a bit of a, a crazy place over the last five years that I've been going down there regularly. And the second thing was, man, that's got to be just cold, cold. Anyway, um, it's a little bit weird around here because it's just me and the three little boys. That I can remember, this is the only time that I have been live on Facebook or anything when it was just me and the three little guys in the house. Even like when Caroline was in Europe, I always had Levi to at least be something of a moderating influence on the craziness of the boys. So, could get weird, I guess, if uh, things go sideways with them. But, I actually have a lot of uh, confidence that they're going to be good. They're going to behave themselves for 30 minutes. And, uh, we will get to be uninterrupted um, while we do this. So... I guess it's five. I don't get to ramble nearly so much because I started late. Truth be told, I was um, making myself a drink. A, a beverage, not a drink like that. It's, it's coffee, okay? I made myself a coffee. I shouldn't have. It's five o'clock. But uh, I, I like coffee. Here we go. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the time that we get to set aside just to, to turn off the outside world and focus in on what your word has to say to us. Lord, I pray that you would give us uh, a return on this investment that we make into your word, into our own hearts and lives, into our relationship with you. Lord, I pray that you would bring back dividends as we... Um, go forth from here into the world, Lord, in wisdom, in grace, in patience, uh, all the things that, that we depend upon you for, mercy. Uh, Lord, I pray that you, that those things would grow up in our, in our hearts like fruit and that we would um, take what we learn today and um, apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, the other thing is there's little baby goats right out my window. I don't know if you'll be able to hear that over the microphone. I should, um, one day, I mean, it's still light outside right now, but I am not going to go do a Bible study outside when it's 45 degrees. One day when it's sunny enough and warm enough and it's not going to go, you know, the sun's still supposed to go down like now, so... Um, one day I'll, I'll give you guys a tour of the baby goats. They're tiny, like kitten sized. Anyway, here we are. Luke chapter 13. Um, uh oh, I'm in Ephesians chapter 5. We have been talking about, um, we've been talking about the kingdom of God in Luke chapter 13. And, um, about the urgency of the gospel. We've um, talked about that, the urgency of repentance and the urgency of 
obedience to the gospel. And, um, well, I'm just going to read some verses from chapter 12 that we had talked about a little bit while back. Uh, Luke 12, verse uh, 54. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, a shower is coming. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be a scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and sky. But why do you not know how to interpret the present time? And of course, we applied that to um, our obedience to the gospel and how the time is short. You know, we might have days or months or years or decades left on the earth, whether Jesus returns or we just individually go home to be with him. Uh, We don't know when that's going to be. And so it's urgent for us to be obedient to the gospel. And um, Jesus illustrated this as he was healing a woman um, who was bent over in, in the synagogue on a Sabbath day. And that made some people angry and Uh, Jesus said, hey, when one of the children of God is in need, we don't have time to wait until we figure out if it's the correct day of the week or not. We we don't have time for that. The time is urgent. And with that, he puts all of his enemies to shame. So as we look at the uh, rest of chapter 13, Jesus has some other things, and I think to say about the kingdom of God, and I think of these things that he's saying as sort of like disclaimers to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is urgent. We we don't have time to wait. And so, though it's a good thing, you know, of course the kingdom of, of, of God is so much greater than any of the kingdoms of this earth, there's a disclaimer to it. Hey, it's urgent. Hey, you can't wait on it. It's not at your beck and call. So, um... That's kind of what I think of as a disclaimer to the kingdom of of heaven, kingdom of God. And Jesus has some more for us. That's kind of an awkward way to explain all that. I hope that made some kind of sense. But here we are. Luke chapter 13. Um, We're going to pick up in verse 18. He said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden. And it grew and became a tree. And the birds of the air made nests in its branches. And he said again, and To what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. So, what are these verses? They're, they're interesting sort of allegories or parables, however you want to talk about them. They really don't seem like any kind of a warning or disclaimer, as I was just talking about. Uh the two analogies here basically just sound like the kingdom of God is going to grow. Jesus is saying, hey, the kingdom of God is like this. Um, It's going to grow. And hey, that's great, right? But maybe that's what Jesus was telling us, just exactly that. Hey, look out, the kingdom of God is going to grow. But there are some things in these parables that I hope would make you stop and think. If you have any kind of familiar, familiarity, familiarity, that, with uh, any of the parables, you know that Jesus uses sort of repeated ideas to drive his point home. Or, I should say, repeated imagery. Things that, that come up very frequently in the parables over and over again. Um, one of them is um, is the presence of um, seeds in this parable. Um, in the parables, sorry, I got lost on my notes there for a minute. I couldn't figure out where I was supposed to be. Um, in the parables, seeds are, I want to say always, maybe not all, maybe not always, but almost always, representative of the word of God coming into someone's life. And it gets planted like a seed. Uh, In the parable of the sower, Jesus explained it like this. This is Mark chapter 14, sorry, 4, verse 14. He says directly, 
the sower sows the word. So the seed that we have in Luke chapter 13 is repeated from other places. But there's another thing in that parable that's also repeated, and that's birds. Also in the parable of the sower, in Mark chapter 4, verse 15, it says, These are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And that's how he explained how the birds came and picked up the seed from the the, the roadside where the seed was scattered. So in our parable today, we have these birds, which before had been represented representative of Satan himself, and they were coming and taking refuge in the tree that is the kingdom of God. That should make you stop and think about it. Uh, what are these birds? They're, they're resting in the kingdom of God. They're taking refuge in the kingdom of God. But they are somehow distinct because this, the tree is the, is the kingdom of God and the birds are coming and taking refuge there. That, there's a distinction between them. Um, is Jesus saying that uh, Satan or perhaps evil people who are uh, controlled by Satan are going to come and hide themselves among the kingdom of God? That's how it looks to me. And if you know something of the history of the church, you'll know that this has been the case. Evil people coming and hiding among the church, uh, pretending to, to be a part of the church, and yet they're not. Over and over and over again throughout history, um, this has happened. And, you know, you don't have to know anything about church history. You can just look around the world today and, man, it sure seems like more often than not, people who are representing the church in one way or another, the people that you see like the face of some organization that's Christian, it seems like so many of those people are hiding. They're, they're evil people hiding among um, Christians. And, you know, most people that I know who were once Christians and then have walked away from the faith have done so because of some evil person misrepresenting Jesus in a place of leadership in the church. Most of the people I know who are Christians have walk and, and walked away from Jesus did so because of that reason, because there was somebody in the church that pretended to be a part of the church and yet they weren't, and it, it wrecked their perception of the faith. Just this week, I had somebody asked me a question about um, holistic healing. And somebody in their church had told them that, uh, or had suggested to them that they do this holistic healing as a form of therapy. And so I responded, hey, I, the one thing I know about holistic healing or holistic medicine or whatever you want to call it is that it seems like everyone I know who has had any kind of experience with that or represents that has a different definition of what that means because it's not standardized. So you're going to have to tell me what you mean when you say that. And so they begin to talk to me about uh, being guided into the womb room in their mind and taking the things that bother them and hanging them on the wall. And that was representative of giving those things to Jesus. And to me, that sounds a whole lot like a bird taking refuge in the kingdom of God. Uh, someone who has no credibility, someone who should not be trusted with anything. And so because they're not credible, they try to borrow some credibility from Jesus. And they're birds hiding in the kingdom of God. And it, the parable of the leaven and the loaves is kind of the same thing. Um, you know, birds in and of themselves in real life are not evil. You know, you go outside, you shouldn't just start shooting every bird that you can see. They're not agents of Satan or anything like that. Leaven is not evil either. Um, leaven is good. In fact, leaven is what makes bread into bread. Otherwise, we just have a bunch of crackers. But in the language of biblical symbolism, as far as I can remember, this is the only time that leaven isn't directly connected to sin. Uh, so while it may be that Jesus was trying to tell 
um, us that the church was going to grow and it would almost seem like magical, uh, I think it's much more likely that he's warning us about sin in the church. Um, and reading the New Testament, almost all of the epistles of, of Paul are written to correct some form of sin in the church. There's something going on, and I think two or three times in the New Testament letters, not just Paul, but I think Peter also says that uh, a little leaven leavens a whole lump. You put a tiny bit of yeast in a loaf of bread, and I, do, I know this because I have baked bread. I'm not just saying this. You put a little bit in, and it affects the whole lump of dough. And it's the same. A little bit of sin affects the whole kingdom of God. Some person misrepresenting Jesus affects all of us in the church. And so while the kingdom of God is so much greater than any kingdom on the earth, we have this disclaimer. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's safe. You know, you can't just trust anyone who comes up to you because they have a Jesus t-shirt on or, you know, you can't hire a contractor to come work on your house just because they have a fish on the back of their truck. Um, it's, it, we can't let our guard down. The kingdom of heaven, uh, has some dangerous elements to it, I, I would say. And so what I'm trying to get to is that we need to have some kind of discernment. So if somebody comes to you and tries to tell you God wants you to practice this guided meditation, use your discernment. Check what the Bible says. Does the Bible tell me anything about that? No, it doesn't. So I'm going to ignore that person's advice and I'm going to follow what the truth of the Bible says. And that includes me. If I'm talking and it sounds like, hey, this guy doesn't actually teach the Bible. He's just got his own ideas. I want you to look in the Bible. I want you to um, read what it says and follow what the Bible says. Don't follow what I have to say. And feel free to ignore me if that's what's going down. All right, here we go. Verse 22. He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, strive to enter, enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. For once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, he will begin to stand outside and a knock on the door saying, Lord, please open to us. And he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then, he will, then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and we taught in you, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not, I do not know where you come from, depart from me, you workers of evil. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourself cast out. And people will come from east and west and north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first and some are first who will be last. So we have the disclaimer that the kingdom of God is, is urgent. We have this disclaimer that uh, there are going to be pretenders in the kingdom of God. And now we see that the entrance into the kingdom of God is narrow. And when um, somebody came to Jesus and asked him about this, hey, are there only going to be a few who are going to be saved? It was so important that Jesus turned to him and got his attention and said, listen, you worry about yourself. You need to strive to enter the narrow gate yourself. He says, don't try to determine anybody else's status in the kingdom that way. You know, every once in a while, I'll run across this article uh, in some Christian magazine or Christianity Today or something like that, talking about whether some actor or musician or some famous person is a Christian because of something they said. I remember having multiple conversations with my youth pastor when I was in high school about whether or not uh, Bono from U2 was saved. Um, I've seen people talking about whether or not Justin Bieber is saved, about whether or not um, Chris Pratt is saved, whether or not Kanye West is saved. And you know what? 
none of that is any of my business. I had nothing to say about what, whether or not those people are Christians because there are going to be so few who are saved. Jesus tells us that when the topic comes up, what we need to worry about is striving to enter into the narrow gate, in the narrow doorway. Now, strive is an interesting word here um, because it means to agonize, to fight, or to struggle. Um, I, I looked up the Greek word, and it's like agonismo or something like that. Um, sounds just like agony. And when it comes to salvation, we can't be passive. We need to agonize for it. And the root of that Greek word for agon agonismo or agonizomai, whatever it was, um, the root of it is describing a um, like a sports arena where the contestants strive to be the winners of the contest, whatever it is. You know, you're watching football or soccer, and um, those people are striving. They're not out there passive. They're not, you know, hoping that their teammates win the game for them. They are personally giving it everything they've got because they want to be the ones to take on the trophy. And it's interesting because there was a lot of people in that arena of agony who are also really caught up in the game, but who aren't actually playing. You know, people crying in the stands or cheering, uh, just losing their mind because they're so excited that the people that they wanted to win the game won the game. And, you know, people have these, these crazy practices of, you know, you only wear a certain shirt on game day because that is lucky and it somehow influences the outcome of the game. Um, or people who won't shave all through playoffs because that has a thing, I guess, superstition. But those people feel very strongly about that competition, but no matter how strongly they feel, they didn't win the trophy at the end. Uh, just like the losing team, they go home without anything. And the fans are going to be like those who stood outside of that door and knocked and said, hey, look at how much we did for you. I didn't shave for a month and a half because you were in the playoffs. How can you say that I wasn't part of the winning team? And the answer is going to be, hey, depart. You weren't on the team. I never knew you. Striving to enter the narrow way, the doorway into heaven, is not about working to enter heaven. It's about obedience to the call of Jesus, and there's a distinction there. It's not about what you have done for God. It's about whether or not you know God. That is the call of Jesus. Jesus doesn't want us to accomplish a whole bunch of things for him. He wants us to come to know him. You know, he kept the law perfectly so that we wouldn't have to keep the law. He died on the cross to give us mercy so that we could have a way that we could answer the call and know him. That is the narrow way, and that's the only way that we can be saved. It says the master of the house is right now, he's holding the door open. He has made a way for us, and all of our striving is all about obediently answering that call and entering into what he has for us. We accept the mercy that he's given to us. And it, 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 in that way, it is passive. You know, I don't earn that. But I have to go after it anyway. Um, and, and he talks about how some who thought they deserved to be in the kingdom, specifically the children of Abraham, the Jews, who thought like, hey, we're part of God's chosen people. We should get an automatic pass. They're going to be on the outside. Where those who were from all over the place, from north and south, east and west, are going to come because they answered the call and sit down with the kingdom, uh, with Jesus in the kingdom. So the the entrance into the kingdom is is narrow and it's urgent. So a lot of people condemn Christianity uh, because they say that is narrow, and you know we should agree. They say with everyone else who says that any way that you live your life is fine. We shouldn't say that Jesus is the only way to heaven, but that all roads lead to heaven. And, well, 
It's actually the Bible that says that entrance into the kingdom is through the narrow way. But you know what? Thank God that he opened up that narrow way for us because before he made that way open, there was no way wide or narrow or anything. There was no way before Jesus opened that way. And so maybe people want us to, to be condemned because we're narrow minded, but look, it's, it's that or nothing. That's the, I guess it's that, that's as narrow as I think of it. And I remember my, again, thinking of my youth pastor, his analogy for that is, look, if I gave you my key ring and said, Hey, I want you to go to my house. Um, here's the keys to my house. It's not narrow minded of him that he only has one key that opens the front door. You know, he's got all these keys that, open, that drive his car that, you know, open the door of his office or open a safe or whatever else. But there is a key. He gave it to me. All I need to do is, is use the key that he gave me and I can enter in through the front door. So maybe that's narrow minded. I don't know, but it is narrow. There's only one way to heaven. And Jesus says it's urgent that we enter in. Verse 31. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I will finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So this last disclaimer about the kingdom of God is a little different from the others. It's, it's for those who are on the outside. In those verses that we just read about the people who were left on the outside of the door and they're knocking, the, this is the disclaimer for these people. The kingdom of God is inevitable. Uh, no matter how much Herod or the, the Pharisees wanted to stop the kingdom of God, no matter how much people want to put their head in the sand and pretend that uh, they will never have to answer for the choices they make in their life, no matter how many people want to say that it's narrow, the kingdom of God is narrow, hey, it is, but it's also unstoppable. Um, Herod tells or Jesus tells Herod and the Pharisees, hey, I'm handling business here. I've got today and tomorrow, those are the days that I'm going to be here handling my business, healing people, casting out demons, those things. And then on the third day, it's it's going to be time for me to finish my course. Now, he wasn't talking about literal days, right? Because he had much more time than than two days before he died. But on our side of things, that means that his course is finished now because that's what he said he was going to do. On His course was finished. So at this point, Jesus is done. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so the only question for us now is what are we going to do? Are we going to be those who strive to know God, to enter into that narrow way, um, to, to overcome all that, that there is? And I think of this not so much as we have to overcome you know, persecution or overcome uh, negative feelings about someone who thinks that we're narrow-minded or whatever. Uh, that's not a thing that I have to overcome. What I have to overcome to enter into the, to the narrow way is the sin and the pride and the laziness of my own heart. That's what I need to overcome. I need to, to strive against that to enter into the narrow door that Jesus is only open for me. Or are you going to be on the outside making excuses for yourself? You know, those are the things, those are the options for us. We can um, be on the inside, thankful for the way into the kingdom of heaven that he's given to us. Or we're going to be on the outside uh, cursing God because we missed the boat. Because we had the opportunity handed to us and we refused it. I want to be one of those who, who calls out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
the only other option there is to be like Jerusalem, who should have been, should have welcomed their king coming in, should have uh, been elated that their Messiah was finally coming to them. And yet, what happens? They they refused. They killed Jesus. And it's funny because when we we'll get there eventually, but you know, on the on the triumphal entry. They were elated to see Jesus. They were so excited, but only because it was exciting. Only because it was convenient for them at that moment. But when it turned out that the kingdom of God is not convenient, that it's it's narrow, that there's uh, you know pretenders in the kingdom, you've got to have your eyes open. When it turned out that the kingdom of God um, is not going to wait for us, they turned and they hated him. And and they they didn't like that the kingdom of God is costly. It's going to cost them. They're going to have to strive to enter into the narrow gate, and not just passively uh, expect. Hey, God owes me something. He's going to save me because He owes it to me. No, we need to to not earn it, but well, as it says in in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That's what it means to strive to enter the narrow way. And I was reminded again about uh, Mary and Martha today, and, and the, the we talked about that right after uh, Thanksgiving about how Mary was, sorry, Martha was all caught up in um, working, in earning her way into heaven, and she was striving, but she wasn't striving for the right thing. Whereas Mary had made her choice, and she had to she had to, to intentionally set all of those things aside, to set off the weight, the pride, and everything else that was trying to entangle her, to set aside the sort of performative righteousness that so many of us uh, think we need. She had to strive for all of that so that she could sit quietly at the feet of Jesus and receive what he had for her. That's what it means to strive to enter the narrow gate, to answer the call of Jesus and enter into the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful for the way into your kingdom that you made for us. Lord, we were on the outside. We were your enemies. We were uh, rebels. We were hating you, Lord. And you loved us even still through all of that. You uh, saw that it was going to cost you your life in order to save us. And so you gladly laid it down. You came to earth and you, you sacrificed yourself so that we could have mercy, so that we could have your forgiveness and we could be restored into your your kingdom lord that we could be called your children that we could be called uh, followers of christ lord we want to be that we want to be just like you as we run this race as we uh, compete in this way we want to be those who lay aside all those weights that drag us down the sin that that tangles us up and run after you. Keep our eyes focused on you because you are the author of our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, folks. Um, hi, Kathy. Hi, Mom. I'm glad you guys made it. But uh, I will see you guys Sunday. Or if not, then I'll see you guys next week. God bless you guys.